Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Williamsburg. Welcome to the, I can't believe I'm saying this, welcome to the inaugural Virginia Funders Network Conference. Which is also coincidentally the largest gathering ever of Virginia philanthropy. So another round of applause. <laughs> My name is Erin Hogan. I am the philanthropic market executive for Bank of America for our Southeast region, I'm a proud Virginia resident and a proud founding board member of the Virginia Funders Network and a co-chair of this conference. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here. This has been such an incredible, uh, uh, great teamwork and just you know energy and engagement from across the entire Commonwealth. Everybody's been working so hard and we've been just uh, listening and learning and we're so happy to spend two days together really just um, convening, to be in community together, to uh, learn what is working, what we could do better, how we could collaborate. Our whole theme for the Virginia Funders Network is Stronger Together and really this reflects our vision and our mission which is really how can we work together and across sectors to make sure that all of Virginia's communities are thriving. So you'll see that across the next two days together. We've got 50 speakers, we've got, um, we've got entertainment, we've got um, incredible stories that we're gonna be sharing. Um, and all of this really, I have to start by thanking the conference co-chairs and the conference committee. And actually, if you were on the conference planning committee, could you just please stand up here for a minute? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody, big round of applause. And also, I have to um, give a special thank you to uh, the one and only Bill Hazel, our honorary co-chair. And on behalf of Carol Sale, who, is, who leads the Williamsburg uh, Health Foundation, she was our co-chair as well and um, unfortunately couldn't be here due to a family uh, illness, but uh, she sends her best and really is here in spirit. And so we're going to do this one for you, Carol. And so here's to Carol. <laughs> So really, um, I want to just, you know, kind of just give everybody a little bit of a, of a moment here to get settled. We're going to have a, a really special conversation about Williamsburg and its roots here. Um, our host committee put together some incredible stories that um, I learned a lot about, so I know everybody else here is really looking forward to it. But um, please just, you know, again, thank everybody for coming. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Really proud that uh, Bank of America is the title sponsor. we got am amazing colleagues and partners that are here as well. So if you see somebody with a sponsor badge, please say thank you. There's always room for more people to come and join uh, the uh, Virginia Funders Network in any way. And so we welcome your partnership and your community. And with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to my good friend uh, on the planning committee, Nancy Sullivan, who leads the Williamsburg Community Foundation. And she's going to introduce our speakers and tee up our conversation over lunch. So welcome. Thank you again. Nancy. Thank you, Erin, and thanks again to all the planning committee members and sponsors who've made today's conference a reality. I'm Nancy Sullivan. I'm the president and CEO of the Williamsburg Community Foundation. I am filling in for my friend and colleague, Carol Sale, who couldn't be here today. So I'm sorry you're not seeing Carol up here in front of you, but um, please keep her and your fa her family in your thoughts um, as they're dealing with some health issues. We are delighted to host the Virginia Funders Network Conference in Williamsburg, and we're glad to welcome you all here. I hope you have the opportunity to get out of the hotel for a little bit and explore. We love Williamsburg, and we're glad to be able to show it off to our colleagues. I'm sure each of you feels the same way about your hometown. The work that we do puts us in a unique position of being able to see all facets of our community and to appreciate the gems that exist throughout, even as we strive with our limited grant dollars in, to improve the quality of life for area residents. Whether our work is funded by a single family, a local business, or by hundreds of donors that contribute to a community foundation, uh, we are all working to improve the quality of life. And we couldn't do our work without philanthropic giving. Williamsburg has become a thriving community because of philanthropy. 
um, and the dollars that have been invested in our local institutions and by our local institutions. One of our unique assets in Williamsburg is Colonial Williamsburg. I now have the pleasure of introducing Earl Granger, trustee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation and chief development officer for Colonial Williamsburg. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon. There are more of you than me. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And welcome to Williamsburg. Uh, in Williamsburg, all kinds of people from many different places and in very different circumstances worked and sacrificed, endured and achieved. It was a community of aspiration and contradiction and it became a crucible for revolution. In the face of unimaginable odds, America's colonies defied the most powerful empire on earth. In so doing, they launched a new nation that forever altered the course of history. Our nation's origin story begins here in Williamsburg. Here in this capital city of Virginia, this economic engine of the American colonies, we see ambition and idealism alongside conflict and struggle. We experience courage and daring, ingenuity, determination, and pragmatism. We see the face of suffering and endurance. In Williamsburg, we can understand the sorrows, fears, joys, and achievements of the people of that time and place and realize how closely related they are to our own. That the future may learn from the past. Never has the mission of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation been more important. Our nation's origin story is a shared American story to inspire us all. This is who we are, Williamsburg. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Carl Childs, my colleague at the, at the foundation, who is currently the Executive Director of Research and Education and the Abby and George O'Neill Director of the John D. Rockefeller Library on site here at CW. He also serves as the Foundation's Director of Archives and Records, responsible for oversight of Colonial Williamsburg's corporate archives and records management programs. Prior to this, he also served as the Deputy Director of the Rockefeller Library. And prior to his time at CW, Carl worked at the Library of Virginia for close to two decades, serving as Director of Local Record Services, where he worked with Virginia's 120 circuit court clerks to preserve the Commonwealth's historic court records. Carl loves to connect people with information. He also loves to prove to people that libraries and archives are still relevant and indispensable community resources. Christy Coleman, the executive director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation once said, behind libraries, museums are the most trusted institutions in America. Carl considers himself fortunate that he gets to work in both. In his spare time, Carl likes to try to stay cool, maybe not like today, um, to spend time in the Blue Ridge Mountains with his wife where they own a log cabin in Northwest North Carolina. Carl also enjoys hiking and biking. He's a graduate, two-time graduate of James Madison University. So I present to you my colleague, Carl Childs. All right, so I was told that I would have to be engaging, inspiring, and entertaining when I came up here because everybody was eating lunch. So my advice to you is, you better go grab some coffee. <laughs> well, we'll get started. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Earl, for making the introduction. And again, um, welcome to all of you to Williamsburg. Um, it's great to have you here. And I really appreciate the invitation to join you um, to talk about and share one of the great fellow philanthropic successes of our time, one that started right here in Williamsburg in the 1920s. 
It's the story of a man with a dream whose partnership and collaboration with one of the richest men in the world helped create Colonial Williamsburg, the largest living history museum in the world. And that long ago collaboration continues to this day and continues to positively impact Williamsburg, Virginia, and well beyond. So let's begin by meeting our two principal figures, Dr. W.A.R. Goodwin, the man with the dream, and John D. Rockefeller, Jr., the man with the means to help make that dream possible. Dr. Goodwin was many things, rector of Bruton Parish Church right here in Williamsburg, professor of philosophy and social service at the College of William and Mary, and director of the college's endowment fund campaign. Goodwin possessed a lifelong interest in historic preservation that resulted in his undertaking several restoration projects for his beloved Bruton Parish Church. And of course, John D. Rockefeller Jr. needs no introduction. His fame was international, heir to the standard oil fortune, financier, conservationist, and the nation's leading philanthropist. These two individuals collaborated to first imagine and then create the educational center we know as Colonial Williamsburg. In 2026, as our nation celebrates its 250th birthday, Colonial Williamsburg will mark its 100th anniversary as a living history museum. It was in December 1926 that Dr. Goodwin received a mysterious telegram authorizing his purchase of an antique, a truly decisive moment in our museum's story, but more on that in just a little bit. Well before that famous telegram arrived in Williamsburg, Dr. Goodwin had a dream to restore Williamsburg, Virginia's colonial capital from 1699 to 1780, to its former glory. In fact, as nearly as 1907, when he was putting the finishing touches on his very first preservation project, restoring Bruton Parish Church, he had the idea of restoring Williamsburg itself, the entire town. The proposition Goodwin wrote, for better or worse, originated in my own dreams, and in these dreams I have seen a city beautiful. And while Goodwin's visions and dreams were all well and good, he clearly lacked the financial resources to make that dream a reality. For the moment, he had to keep that dream to himself. In late 1907, Goodwin left Williamsburg for an appointment at a well-to-do parish in Rochester, New York, where he would spend the next 14 years. When Goodwin returned to Williamsburg in 1922, he came home to a Williamsburg very much changed, and in his opinion, not for the better. During World War I, military bases and a munitions factory had sprung up in the neighborhood. The 20th century and all its improvements had invaded the town. His beloved Duke of Gloucester Street, filled with gas stations, paved streets, and automobiles, was now just a small cog in the new concrete highway connecting Newport News and Richmond. So what would Dr. Goodwin have seen when he strolled down Duke of Gloucester Street upon his return? Fortunately for us, in 1930, a film crew from Harvard College visited Williamsburg, loaded a camera on the back of a flatbed truck, and shot footage of the city, providing us a virtual tour of Williamsburg before it was restored tavern that you see right there um, had just been completed in 1930 when, when he came back. So when Goodwin returned to Williamsburg, having been appointed rector of Bruton Parish Church once again, and with the help of the colonial, colonial dames of America, the church vestry, and hundreds of donors, he purchased and restored George Wythe's historic home on Palace Green, making it the new parish house. And from that new office, he dreamed again of restoring the entire city to its 18th century appearance. And this time, he put his fundraising experience to work, searching for a benefactor to help. At first, he focused his efforts on Henry and Edsel Ford, writing them several letters and attempting to sell them on his idea of funding the restoration of Williamsburg. Goodwin's approach with the Ford, shall we say, left a bit to be desired. In his letters, he placed the fault for what he saw as the demise of the town squarely on the Ford's shoulders. Their invention of the automobile, he argued, had been the fundamental contributor to the demise of the town. An interesting fundraising approach. 
So let me just share a little bit, uh, a couple lines from Goodwin's letter uh, that he wrote to, to Henry Ford. Uh, you can probably read some of that, but unfortunately, you and your father are at present the chief contributors to the destruction of this city. <laughs> with the new concrete roads leading from Newport News to Richmond, and with the road to nearby Jamestown passing through the city, garages and gas tanks are fast spoiling the whole appearance of the old streets in the old city. And most of the cars which stop at the garages and gas tanks are, you guessed it, Ford cars. <laughs> Since the Fords were responsible for the city's demise, Goodwin reasoned, it was only fair that they help restore it. Predictably, but politely, the Fords declined Goodwin's proposal. Edsel Ford crafted a letter on behalf of his father. We regret that Mr. Ford's many activities are absorbing his entire attention. He is therefore unable to interest himself in the matter mentioned. <laughs> Pretty polite, huh? All things considered. So Dr. Goodwin turned his sights elsewhere, focusing his efforts on finding a different benefactor. Enter John D. Rockefeller Jr., heir to the Standard Oil Fortune, the nation's leading philanthropist. For the next two years, the preacher courted his patron. Like Goodwin, Rockefeller was a Phi Beta Kappa member. The fraternity, founded in Williamsburg at the Raleigh Tavern in 1776, was scheduled to celebrate its 150th anniversary in 1926. And as luck would have it, Mr. Rockefeller was serving as chairman of a fundraising committee for the construction of a new Phi Beta Kappa building, a memorial hall to be built at the College of William and Mary. In March 1926, Mr. Rockefeller, with his family in tow, came to town to check on the progress of the building's construction. Dr. Goodwin saw his opening, and he took it. Goodwin carried the Rockefe Rockefeller family on a tour of the former colonial capital, including a stop at Bassett Hall, where Rockefeller admired the woods and sat under a stately great oak tree on the property, a property that Rockefeller would eventually come to own. The location quickly captured Rockefeller's imagination, and he asked Goodwin, if I come back someday, can we bring our lunch down and eat together under the oak tree. Rockefeller returned to Williamsburg again in November 1926 for the formal dedication of the Phi Beta Kappa building. And you can see Mr. Rockefeller and Doc Dr. Goodwin seated together in the second row. Dr. Goodwin was a genius at getting himself the right seat at the table. <laughs> the two sat together at dinner and chatted about the possibility of restoring the Wren building at the college and perhaps one or two other central buildings in the city. By dessert, Rockefeller had agreed to pay for surveys and sketches of the proposed projects, but made it very clear, in no uncertain terms, that he was committing to nothing further. He also insisted that his identity in this endeavor must remain a secret. Goodwin's faith was soon put to the test when a real estate agent informed him that the historic Ludwell Paradise House on Duke of Gloucester Street was on the market for $8,000. Unable to contain his excitement about the pending sale, Goodwin hurried off two very long letters to Rockefeller explaining the opportunity and providing the details on the house and its history. And then he waited. And at long last, at 11.28 a.m. on December 6, 1926, a telegraph arrived in Williamsburg that clattered out a cryptic response to the doctor. Again, a little tough to read. Authorized purchase of antique referred to in your long letter of December 4th at 8 on basis outlined in shorter letter, same date, signed David's father. The antique referenced was the Ludwell Paradise House, and of course David's father was Rockefeller himself, a code name that the two used for the next several years in order to maintain Rockefeller's anonymity. Mr. Rockefeller's telegram had authorized his first purchase on behalf of the foundation, though he insisted on keeping his role in the purchase of the house a secret from the public, a secret that Dr. Goodwin guarded zealously. Dr. Goodwin, Rockefeller wrote, is at liberty to say when and to whom he thinks it wise that Ludwell Paradise House has been purchased with money which he succeeded in raising from interested friends. In fact, it wasn't until two years later, in 1928, that the mystery benefactor's identity was finally revealed to the public in a series of community meetings held in Williamsburg. Goodwin went back to work, 
eagerly building on this budding relationship, invited Rockefeller and his family to Williamsburg in May 1927 to again tour the town, examine the architectural drawings and sketches that had been prepared, and to discuss Goodwin's further plans for the restoration. Again, to this point, Rockefeller had only authorized payment for the conceptual drawings. He had committed to nothing further. In preparation for Rockefeller's visit, Goodwin asked his assistant, Elizabeth Hayes, to help compile a notebook that included a historical sketch and photo of each of the properties to be restored, including the buildings in the College of William & Mary's historic campus. One can only imagine the good doctor and Miss Hayes trudging through the town's muddy spring roads compiling the information. The notebook was entitled Historical Notes and Tentative Suggestions Relative to the Restoration of Colonial Williamsburg, Capital of Colonial Virginia, and was given to Rockefeller so that he could wander the city with his family and envision and appreciate the entirety of Goodwin's plan. Not only was the notebook a sales pitch to Mr. Rockefeller, it would also serve as an early business plan for the restoration. After the meeting, Rockefeller author authorized Goodwin to negotiate a lease on the former Capitol site, to buy property across the street from it, to protect other lots involved in their plans, to acquire additional parcels along Francis and Duke of Gloucester streets, and a good deal more. In 18 short months, Dr. Goodwin spent nearly 2.7 million of Rockefeller's dollars on 194 properties. Remember, this is the 1930s. He negotiated with the city and county the transfer of the common greens, the courthouse, and the palace lot. And one can only imagine the rumors that must have swirled through the town as the local preacher bought up entire sections of the city. But Mr. Rockefeller still made no further commitment to Goodwin's overall plan, and beyond a very select circle, he remained a silent partner. It was much more than modesty. The mere mention of the name of America's wealthiest man was sure to send local property prices soaring. Finally, in November 1927, Rockefeller committed himself fully to the embodiment of Dr. Goodwin's vision, deciding to fully fund the restoration plan that Goodwin and Hayes had presented to him. In a letter to his private secretary and trusted advisor, Charlie Haight, Rockefeller wrote, the purpose of this undertaking is to restore Williamsburg, so far as it may be possible, to what it was in the old colonial days and to make it a great center for historical study and inspiration. <clears throat> in June 1928, when it could no longer be delayed, Dr. Goodwin, with Mr. Rockefeller's consent, announced Rockefeller's involvement at a mass meeting held at the local high school. At the meeting, the city of Williamsburg, with the verbal approval of its assembled citizens, approved the transfer of Market Square and Palace Green to Colonial Williamsburg Incorporated. After the vote, Goodwin thanked Mr. Rockefeller and addressed the assembled crowd. We should return thanks that this place has been chosen as a shrine of liberty and of beauty. The two partners had realized early on that the massive undertaking they envisioned would require a formal organization to organize and carry out the work. In February 1928, two bodies were incorporated to begin the project. Colonial Williamsburg Incorporated was formed to carry out the educational role of the restoration, while the Williamsburg Holding Co Corporation was created to carry out its business operations. It was responsible for the purchase of properties and all physical restoration and construction work. The Raleigh Tavern, the first of Colonial Williamsburg's exhibition buildings, opened in September 1932 with a dedication ceremony that included speeches by Virginia Governor John Garland Pollard and state and local dignitaries. It concluded with Dr. Goodwin's formal opening of the front door to admit the first guests. The Raleigh Tavern opening was quickly followed by the opening of several other major exhibition buildings, the Governor's Palace and the Capitol buildings in 1934. And in the ensuing years, millions of visitors flocked to Williamsburg to visit its exhibition buildings, trade shops, and learn about 18th century history. Goodwin and Rockefeller continued their Williamsburg collaboration until Goodwin's death in 1939. Before Goodwin's passing, however, the two began an ongoing correspondence, which highlighted the close relationship and mutual ad admiration that had developed between them. Reflecting on the success and ongoing impact of their joint venture, 
Rockefeller wrote to Goodwin, the circle started by the pebble which you threw into the lake in our early talk some years ago have widened and extended as you and I hardly dare dream or hope they would. It is true that neither you nor I dreamed when we started the restoration the extent to which it would go or the significance which would attach to it. What an intensely interesting development it has been. The restoration continued to grow under Rockefeller's watchful eye for the next several decades. He was often involved in important questions central to the restoration, and not just from a fundraising perspective. In 1955, John D. Rockefeller Jr. formally stepped away from everyday involvement in the restoration, telling employees, as I look into your faces, recall what you have done and are doing in your communities, the positions you hold, the things you stand for. I have high hopes for the future of restored Williamsburg. It is with the fullest confidence in you that the mantle of my responsibility has fallen on your shoulders. May you find as much pleasure in carrying on the restoration as I have had in developing it. And may this restored city ever stand as a beacon light of freedom to the world. Before stepping down, however, <clears throat> Rockefeller made a final unrestricted financial gift of $15 million to Colonial Williamsburg. The gift was in the support of his view that the foundation should have educational, interpretive, and preservation programs and resources supported well beyond the revenue provided by visitors to the historic city. Colonial Williamsburg's current endowment traces its beginnings to this incredibly generous gift, which we continue to depend on to carry out our educational mission. It's often said that Colonial Williamsburg was John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s favorite philanthropic venture. And the Rockefeller family has honored his memory by continuing to support Colonial Williamsburg, investing its time, talents, and dollars in the foundation in many ways. Serving on its boards, donating art and manuscript collections, making additional financial gifts, and perhaps most importantly, passing on to younger family members a sense of duty and responsibility to continue the work of John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Today, a Rockefeller descendant serves on our board of trustees and chairs our educational committee. And from a very personal perspective, my position as Abby and George O'Neill Director of the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Library and the library building itself exist thanks to generous gifts from Rockefeller descendants. <clears throat> the impact of the Rockefeller philanthropy continues to influence the educational mission of Colonial Williamsburg and has led to inspired and uh, has inspired countless others to become donors as well. Today, Colonial Williamsburg's impact continues to grow through both on-site and online visitation. And we are reaching larger and larger, larger audiences through new digital programming and through initiatives such as the Bob and Marion Wilson Teachers Institute. The Teachers Institute annually brings teachers from around the country to Williamsburg, <coughs> excuse me, for immersive on-site educational experiences and resources, which they then take back to their classrooms and share with tens of thousands of students nationwide. The Goodwin-Rockefeller collaboration that began nearly 100 years ago continues to help meet educational needs across our country. Colonial Williamsburg plays a pivotal role in educating teachers, students, and the public about the origins of our country, the 18th century, and its relevance to modern events, and ensuring that the future continues to learn from the past. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Katie Moore. I'm the CEO of the Virginia Funders Network. It is so exciting to see you all here in person. Carl, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Um, it's amazing what, uh, what a couple of folks in a dream and a little bit of investment can do, right? Just that little bit of investment. Um, so uh, we have two fabulous days lined up for us um, and, and, a, and a great agenda. I want to really thank the uh, conference co-chairs, the committee, um, our board, and all of you who have invested in what was essentially an idea that Virginia's funders could be stronger together. And here we are, it's becoming a reality. 
um, we are all here in person and it's so nice to have met you all in 2D and now to be here physically in 3D with all of you.